The Golden Gate Bridge is always a wonderful sight, but it's especially delightful to see it this way. We've been plying the waters of the North Pacific now for 10 days on a great ship, and the bridge is welcoming us home. And we come bearing grand tales of the last frontier, Alaska. It is a mythical land. The images of its glaciers, icy peaks, and deep fjords live in our imaginations. A fabled place rich with whales and bears and eagles. Alaska is majestic and rugged, the one American place where nature has not yet been corralled. Its wildness still surrounds and dominates people. It's the images of that wildness that draws us to Vancouver, Canada. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. How are you? Good to meet you. Yeah, Carla, get in here. 80 Bay Area people are making this journey as the KQED Travel Club, a fundraising effort for public television. You know, it's a great. Alaskans have great stories to tell about their own lives because they've, it takes a lot to, to get here and it takes a lot to stay here. I've been asked to help lead the group because I lived in Alaska for nine years. And then I realized, you know, it's a long way up here. <laughs> Our 10-day journey aboard the Royal Odyssey takes us through southeast Alaska, a 500-mile stretch of islands and waterways along the border of British Columbia. We'll visit Ketchikan, Juneau, Glacier Bay, Skagway, and Sitka. We sail the Inside Passage, slipping quietly past waterfalls and isolated villages. The scenery promises to become more and more dramatic as we travel north. For now, we await Ketchikan, hoping to avoid its legendary rainfall. Well, guess what? It was raining this morning in Ketchikan, so I've got wet hair, but it's clearing up. You know, who knows what'll happen? You know, when I lived here, it always amazed me to see these huge ships dwarf the small little town. Ketchikan thrives on tourism, but it's also a center for salmon fishing. The town was founded on the site of an historic Clinkett Indian fishing camp. Creek Street is Ketchikan's best known and most photographed section. Now, Creek Street has a notorious history. It was once upon a time Ketchikan's red light district, where, as they said, the men and the salmon came to spawn. Sure, he wants to tour Dolly's house. Best tour he's going to Take all the photos. The bordellos and saloons of yesteryear have been transformed into boutiques, gift shops, and restaurants catering to tourists in the summer months. Our stay in Ketchikan will last six hours, just enough time for us to get into the countryside. Off to the left is the Tongass National Rainforest. Kevin Carrithers is our guide on Lake Harriet Hunt. It's the second largest rainforest in the world with 16 million acres, seconded only by the Amazon rainforest. Kevin is from Sacramento. I love the outdoors, so I'm in awe up here. I, I have no idea what to do with myself. It's great. The peacefulness of the lake is broken only by the high spirits of fellow travelers. And by the sound of our own echoes. Just south of Ketchikan is the Clinkett village of Saxman. Visitors are welcome to the village to learn about the history and customs of the Clinkett people. Some of that history is carved in wood. Here in Alaska is, is our culture, and uh, we're trying to piece it together. We're trying to maintain it. Nathan Jackson is a master carver and a man well worth visiting. What we have to offer is what people can be able to see. I'm only a small segment in a way with my artwork and my hands and ability and the talent which is God given to me and I'm going to put it to use. Cruising has its own pace. We quickly learn to pack in as many experiences as possible before the ship calls us back. And while our time ashore is brief, our time on board ship is not wasted. Cruising through Southeast Alaska has its own rewards. When 
we come back, one perfect afternoon in Alaska. Oh, wow. <laughs> Our next port of call is Juneau, population only about 30,000. It is America's most isolated state capital. You can't drive to Juneau from anywhere else in Alaska. There are no roads in or out. In southeast Alaska, people fly or sail or stay at home. Juneau is a thriving slice of civilization surrounded by rugged mountains. It has the energy of a state capital, but retains its small town charm. This is the governor's house. You can walk right up and ring the bell. And the Mendenhall Glacier pushes down the mountain and inside the city limits. Bill, what do you think about this? Pardon me? What do you think about this? Is it getting pretty crazy? It's so, such fun. Such fun. <laughs> I love it. My good friend, Bill Wheaton, is traveling with me on this trip. Bill and I have shared many adventures over the years, and today we're planning another one, exploring glaciers and searching for wildlife. Wow. Oh, man. Look. A journey by helicopter offers an exciting perspective of the Mendenhall Glacier. Uh, the ice field is 1,500 square miles. Bob Brown is our pilot and glacier guide. To give you a size comparison, that's just a little bit bigger than the state of Rhode Island. Sometimes when I have people sitting in the front seat of the aircraft, see it for the first time when I come up the ridge, or their jaw opens up, they're just like, wow, I never thought I'd ever see this. The Mendenhall Glacier is about 12 miles long. It pushes forward at about two feet per day, but it recedes nearly three, melting into a small lake. Over the past 250 years, it has shrunk several miles back into the Mendenhall Valley. All yep. right. Wow, look at this. <laughs> Can you believe it? It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Oh, man. Uh. Look at how, how this way. This is incredible blue lake sitting out this way. A view out towards the mountains in the back. Yeah, that's gorgeous. Look at this blue. God. Just that you pull it up. It looks like if you pull it up, the ice is going to be blue, but it's not. It's just all that compressed ice. and it just The ice it just is compressed that, uh, so tightly that only blue light escapes. Now, some people think when they look at the glacier, they think it's been formed right here where we're standing. Right. Well, all this ice originally from up in the ice field. Up there. Exactly. And this ice is anywhere between 75 to 100 years old. A lot of folks in the KQED group took helicopter tours of the glaciers. They all agree it was a memorable experience. Beautiful. I've never seen anything like this before. It is wonderful. What a treat. <laughs> Thank you, pal. <laughs> Alaska is a land of contrasts. In the same hour, you can go from frozen rivers up in mountain ice fields down to ocean bays teeming with wildlife. There are whales and porpoises, eagles and seals out here. You just have to know where to look or with whom to look. I suppose you've got plenty of eagle shots. We're in the company of a couple of true Alaskan characters, Trapper and Captain Larry. Captain Larry guarantees we'll see wildlife because he employs the swag system. It's a scientific wild ass guess. <laughs> His system actually works. Right yes, right there, right there. <laughs> it leads us to porpoises. Oh yeah, oh great. Back, they're back behind us. Bill. But the porpoises lead us on a wild goose chase. Oh, yeah. While we strain for a good view of the porpoises, several bald eagles are eyeing us. Oh, man. Oh, oh. Woo! Oh, my God. We're excited, but not satisfied. It's the big catch that we're after, whales. We wait anxiously and watch. Our time in Juno is running short. Gonna get the fluke. Yeah. Oh, look at that hump. Oh, up. God. There it is. There it is. Yeah! There it is. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, patience, work. 
One of the unique things about cruising is that after a day in the wilds of Alaska, you can settle into the comforts of your city at sea. Just about anything you might want is on board, from nightclubs Opa! to libraries. You can find something to do day and night, or find a comfortable chair and take in the passing scenery. The food is very good and very plentiful. Fortunately, there's a gym to work it off. I lived in Alaska for about nine years and I've been back many times since, but until this cruise, I have never before worn a tuxedo in the last frontier. Cruising is not exactly the back road style of traveling. You have to follow someone else's schedule and it's sometimes hard to get off on your own. On the other hand, it's a good way for a group to travel together and share experiences. And now and then, it's just nice to relax and leave all the details to someone else, like sailing very close to a tidewater glacier. I'm gonna keep my hands away from this. I don't you better do it, <laughs> unless you're going to stick here. <laughs> when we come back, cruising into Glacier Bay and the little town we hated to leave. Our next stop is Skagway, a little town that boomed big time during the great gold rush of the 1890s. Thousands of miners passed through here on their way to the gold fields in the Yukon. I had told everyone in our group that they should ride the White Pass and Yukon Railroad. It's a pretty dramatic railroad trip. It sure is. The railroad follows the treacherous trail towards the Yukon the miners once took, climbing and twisting through the mountains. Well, we are looking really forward to coming on this train. We heard a lot about it, read about it. Just so excited about being here. It's been great. Unfortunately, this train ride has become my only disappointment of our Alaskan journey. Bad weather has finally caught up with us. We cannot see much of this wonderfully rugged landscape. We are leaving the United States of America and entering into British Columbia, Canada. It can be sunny around here, but more often you'll find clouds and rain. Yet despite the disappointment, the weather couldn't dampen our enthusiasm for Alaska. To me, it just exceeds all my expectations. It definitely does. I mean, it's grand. It's just so beautiful. I don't want to leave ever, but I have to. You would stay? I would stay if I could afford it. Yeah. Hey, we'll come back sometime, too. Enjoy it again. I have one word. Magnificent. Awesome. Or awesome. Absolutely yeah. awesome. And nothing in southeast Alaska is more awesome than Glacier Bay. Glacier Bay was probably the most anticipated destination of our entire trip. Everyone got up early and came outside to see this little ice age. We noticed it's gotten very quiet on board. David Tilford is a ranger at Glacier Bay National Park. Well, it's kind of, it is interesting to see their faces. They've been traveling on a fairly luxurious cruise ship and uh, going into the ports and looking at the gift shops. And they get up here and you see their eyes get a little bit wider and their jaw drop just a little bit. Ah, uh, there it is. There we go. Oh. Whoa, nice fall there. You see that? In the distance, we could see ice falls crashing into the sea. Oh, there it goes. There it goes some more. Right there. Whoa, start screaming. <laughs> Since I cannot use a whistle. <laughs> it's much more than I ever even had imagined. And the colors, the colors are just beautiful, absolutely beautiful. John Muir was the first non-native person to explore Glacier Bay in 1879 by canoe. It'd be nice to see Glacier Bay in the bright sunlight, but this is the way John Muir first saw it, shrouded in mystery. 200 years ago, there was no Glacier Bay. This was solid ice. The glacier has receded an incredible 70 miles in just 200 years. Now, when I come here, I guess I feel very small. <laughs> I look up at Tidewater Glaciers, two, 300 feet high and a mile or two uh, long, and I start, I guess, realizing that maybe I'm not quite as significant as I thought I was. Human beings have been trying to assert their significance in Alaska for thousands of years, 
the Russians tried their hand in Alaska beginning more than two centuries ago. Their historic capital is our final port of call, the city many in our group enjoyed the most, Sitka. Sitka is a treasury of Russian history, native culture, and Alaskan wilderness. Now this is the uh, Russian Bishop's House. It was built in 1842 here in Sitka, and it is the oldest intact building in all of Alaska. It was built for Alaska's first Russian Orthodox bishop. This was the uh, bishop's bedroom over here, mm -hmm. and then he had this. Now it's a time capsule of 19th century right Russian living. That was, his, uh, that was his desk that he made back in the 1840s. The chatter of ravens breaks the silence at Sitka National Historic Park. The quiet of this tranquil forest once was broken by the hostile cries of war as Russians and Clinkets fought bloody battles on this ground. Do you want to take that away? Or, uh... Now, in their own small way, Eugene Solovyov and Terry Rothkar are healing the wounds their ancestors inflicted 200 years ago. Eugene is from Russia. Terry is Clinket. Together, they operate the Sitka Rose, a gallery featuring the works of local artists. We thought it was a really good time to kind of, using the arts as a way to kind of bring it all back together instead of apart like it's been for a long time. <laughs> the combination is really nice. In these days, yeah. we don't try to take over the town. We try to respect the culture. <laughs> Eugene's accent may be difficult to understand, <laughs> but the affection he and Terry have for each other and their cultures is unmistakable. So relationships are better now than they were then. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you bet. In the first half of the 19th century, there were only three major cities on the Pacific Rim, Canton, China, San Francisco, and Sitka. Now of those, Sitka was the largest. Largest thing, larger yes. than Canton? Yeah, for, for a while, Sitka was the largest, largest one. Dr. James Davis has studied Sitka and loves its history. Just Sitka was more important than San Francisco? <laughs> And again, most of the manufacturing that was done on the Pacific Rim was done here, in Sitka. Today, Sitka's population is about 9,000, not much more than it was in 1867, when Alaska was purchased by Americans. Sitka feels genuine, like it doesn't exist only for visitors. It'll still be here, even if tourists aren't. And as we head back to the mother ship, many of us make a pledge to return. When we come back, our farewell to Alaska and dramatic return to San Francisco. I'd never cruised to Alaska before. In most ways, it was a delightful experience, especially watching the landscape slip by slowly in the company of new friends from the Bay Area, listening to my old companion and a boy with cancer talk about their experiences of walking on glaciers. I've been up in helicopters before, but never landed on a glacier. And it was so beautiful from up there. I, I really loved that. Cruising is a deceptive experience too, far more comfortable and forgiving than Alaska itself. Alaska is always prepared to exact a price from those who forget they're in a wild place. I suspect that's what compels many of us to visit. There is wonder beyond our control in this last great fortress of nature. It dwarfs our big ships and reminds us that nature still demands our respect. 